Thank you very much, and thank you, Joel, for that introduction, and uh, uh, Debbie as well for your wonderful hospitality uh, during my visit here in this absolutely beautiful part of the nation. I've always wanted to come here, um, and here I am. It's a delight. I also want to thank the Virginia Book Festival and the um, uh, Virginia Institute for Humanities, was it? A foundation for the Humanities. Um, these events are um, crucial for keeping culture alive in our country, especially, again, in the times of tough funding. Um, and uh, the opportunity all around is deeply appreciated. Um, my interest in Humboldt, there's, there are long stories there, and I will not go into them. I've got an eye on the clock. Um, I can go on, on Humboldt for days, if you let me. My interest started when I was working on Henry David Thoreau as a graduate student, and I was curious how Thoreau had found the model for the work he was doing in natural sciences. And it seemed to me that, that the contemporary scholarship didn't have the answer to that. I was taking a seminar in the works of Charles Darwin. The professor dropped a heavy tome um, on her laps and said, read this, Darwin did. And I did, it was Alexander von Humboldt's uh, personal narrative. And I thought, my gosh, this is it. It has to be Humboldt. And so that was the start of a very, very long quest that's still going on today into understanding Humboldt's um, um, impact and influence in the United States, which was uh, uh, quite broad. That turned out to be astonishing because every time I talked to people about Humboldt, I got that glazed look, Humboldt who? And so part of my mission has been to, uh, to well, to explain something about Humboldt who, uh, how wonderful and important he was. So just a very, very quick thumbnail um, introduction to him here. Joel um, also gave uh, some useful information. I, I love this photograph because he looks uh, so warm and approachable, and this was the man um, that I have heard described. He was... Um, um, he, he was just exactly as warm and, and uh, lively as he looks in this photo. Taken just a few months before his death um, in 1859, uh, which was then a few months before uh, The Origin of Species was published, um, which was, would have been kind of a nice speculation to imagine had he uh, read The Origin of Species. Um, well, counterfactual history. Anyway, he was born in Berlin. Um, some people uh, know the Humboldt name also through his brother, Wilhelm von Humboldt, uh, born just a couple of years earlier, uh, the famous uh, linguist, uh, philosopher, founder of the University of Berlin. Um, Alexander von Humboldt is probably most famous for his American travels, uh, 1799 to 1804. And when I say American, we're speaking North and South America. I'll be putting up a map in a moment. Uh, May and June of 1804, he finished off his American travels with visits in Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Returned to Europe to live in Berlin until 1827, where many Americans came to visit him. Uh, excuse me, lived in Paris until 1827, and then moved to Berlin. First thing he did when he got to Berlin was try to shake up uh, a German science uh, by delivering a series of lectures uh, uh, under the title Cosmos. He was urged to publish them, which he eventually did um, from 1845 to 62 in a greatly expanded version that was never completed. So uh, Cosmos was the culmination of a long career, um, and you will be hearing more about Cosmos um, uh, at, at the end. So what I'll be doing is, is uh, moving through, reading some of my favorite passages, and making sure to say a few things about Jefferson, given the context here. <laughs> Um, and it is, one of the, again, one of the surprises and one of the um, fascinating aspects of Humboldt was um, his friendship with Thomas Jefferson. So uh, here's Humboldt, um, the, the romantic portrait of Humboldt um, in his uh, explorations to South America. So we moved from the, young, the old Humboldt to the young Humboldt. It seems fitting that Humboldt launched from Spain for there is a certain quixotic quality to his venture. The slim and blue-eyed Humboldt, with sturdy Bonpland, his cheerful sidekick, tilting at the windmills of Spanish ignorance, prejudice, and colonialism on their endless picaresque travels. For in a sense, Humboldt's travels never really did end. 
Even when he wasn't on the road, he was always in motion, in transit, planning the next trip. He abandoned national loyalties to become the paradigmatic cosmopolitan, at home, everywhere, and nowhere, always passing through, a merchant of knowledge with a bag full of notions. In a time of closed ports, armed borders, gunboats, and pirate ships, he alone passed freely, slipping through with a smile and a story, like Marnu in Melville's Taipei. Shielded by his royal letters of passport, he talked and he listened. Friendly, sociable, charismatic, passing from huts to plantations to palaces, hop bobbing like a cork on turbulent seas. Not for him the fate of Georg Forster, trapped and consumed between France and Germany, or Montufar, shot in the revolution, or Bonpland, ambushed in a border war. No, unlike his friends who succumbed to the rising forces of nationalism, Humboldt the nomad stayed afloat in a world of political and natural turbulence, learning to skate well, as Emerson said, on thin ice, to be always in passage. Humboldt traveled not from country to country, but through a planetary field of geological, historical, and environmental forces. His coordinates were not political, but bioregional, rivers, mountain passes, coastlines, trails, and roads. It's seldom clear exactly what country he's in, as he sifts and compares, moving up, down, and across both spatial and temporal scale levels, continents and eons, on the alert for harmonies and resonances that he can test to see if they might justifiably be called laws. To assume he is another Enlightenment universalizing agent writing the meta-narrative for all time is precisely wrong. For there's no global in this most planetary of thinkers, only the local at every point generating the patterns and harmonies that combine to a collective whole. His view is not an eagle's flight to God vision, but hovers down lower, darting like a bee from point to point, where everything can be seen, touched, and connected, collecting nectar for the hive and cross-pollinating as he goes. This requires hard work, constant motion, and an astonishing memory. Each passage in Humboldt is a series of crossings, person to person, speech to text, chaotic jungle to labeled specimen, crossing in turn overland to a port and across the ocean to a scientific center to be re-translated by someone on his burgeoning team botanists, physicists, anatomists, astronomers, engravers, colorists. Every crossing was a transformation, a creative act that invented as much as it transmitted. As his text traveled, passing from reader to reader, readers in turn performed their own acts of reinvention, deploying Humboldt for their own needs. From Darwin on the Beagle, to Thoreau at Walden Pond, to John Bachman in the urbane port of Charleston, or Susan Fenimore Cooper in rural New York, and beyond to Europe, Africa, Siberia, India, Australia. This network of passages is universal only as train tracks may be said to cover the world. Yes, while they reach from coast to coast, they are easily interrupted at any point. The king or the corporation refuses access. The mule falls. The ship wrecks. The shipment is confiscated. The botanist abandons his work to take up gardening instead. The publisher goes bankrupt. Key books go untranslated, creating blind spots otherwise inexplicable. Humboldt generated small islands of order interlinking them in a widening chain until he'd built an archipelago of knowledge that reached across the planet. For Humboldt's cosmos uses the earth, not God, to orient the self. Passages are made in small craft that leak and large ones that dodge blockades along ocean currents and in storms, down Inca roads, and up rivers guarded by Indians with curare-tipped arrows, 
across bridges and canals, natural, built, and imaginary.